Hi everyone, Charles from The Food People here. I hope you're all keeping safe and well. It's my real great pleasure to welcome Mr. Fish, a true man of the sea, chef, author and restaurateur, Mitch Tonks. Mitch joins me today to talk about how all of this came about, his journey to this point, his growing restaurant group, his affinity with the Southwest, a little bit about purpose, and we're going to talk about tinned seafood. So welcome, Mitch. Really good to have you here. Yeah, nice to be here, Charles. Very nice to see you. Um, at The Food People, we're very clear about why we do what we do. We're champions of change. We're driven every day by our intent to shift the future of food and drink by harnessing the power of trends. And in this, what is the second series of In Conversation With, it's all about talking to people and businesses and brands and entrepreneurs across the food and drink spectrum to find out more about why they do what they do and how in their way they're championing change and shifting the future of food and drink. Great to be talking to you, Mitch. I think we'll just dive straight in, if that's all right. Dive straight in. Okay. I love um, yeah, and, absolutely. Let's chat. Yeah, let's do it. Um, let's start with the beginning. Where did all of this start? I mean, did you come from a foodie family? Um, yeah, how did it all begin? I grew up in a place called uh, Western Supermare on the north coast in Somerset, and uh, my grandmother was ever-present in my life. Um as with my mum, both very good cooks, but they were cooks of necessity. And uh, I always, you know, I look back and remember what I felt was normal at the time, but I re realised now I was very lucky. Um, Christmas puddings being made in October, there was brawn, there was boiled tongues. Okay. My mum used to make her own bread, have her own chickens in the garden. You know, she would go and get fish. There'd be live eels in the reams. And, you know, we'd go to the butchers, we'd go to the greengrocers, we would go to the fishmongers. And I always used to remember the fishmonger shop, Mac Fisheries. It was one of the, the Scottish, um, what I know now as a Scottish family that had boats and fishmongers. And I can still remember going in there, this you know, big slab and piles of crab, that smell of freshly cooked crab, of gurnards and red mullets and all of these things and brown shrimps. And we used to go home and either pick crab or peel brown shrimps for sandwiches. And uh, I'd sit there over a bit of newspaper and, uh, and we do it. And I, I sort of look back really, and I think that's where it all, where my love of food started. Yeah. And uh, and that 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 was that was really good. And then as a boy, I always you know you'd leave home early in the morning, you'd go fishing, you, you were back home for five o'clock for your tea, and you yeah. and you'd make your own your own fun. And that was always you know down by the water or in it. Um, yeah. Someone who was great. No, fantastic. I mean, as you were just talking there, actually, remember I've got some real fond memories. My my grandfather actually was a was a chef in the army, um, but he also had a, when he came out of the army a huge passion and just love for food. He grew a lot of his own food, and I remember, funny enough, <laughs> he talked about um, crab and brown shrimp. I remember he used to uh, we used to go around there and he used to have a little bag that he used to have brown shrimp in and he used to you know he'd eat he'd eat one i'd eat one yeah it takes yeah. me right back to to childhood it's, and that amazing flavor and you know it's interesting uh, there was um you know occasionally as a guy who gets me some fresh brown shrimp because a lot of the brown shrimp you know from uh, come from abroad yeah and they've been frozen or you know and i get fresh ones and i'm right back to my grand's table it's a unique flavor it takes really you is. back there isn't it food, yeah. and, food and memories with people and places absolutely. yeah abs but, absolutely right going from there how did you then become a chef what inspired you to do that how did all of that come about well, I, I had kids very young I was 20 with uh, with two kids 21 actually with two kids and uh, you know I was sort of you know doing anything to make money really and I ended up working in London for a, a really wonderful guy who had a um, he was he was a Jewish guy had a clothing had a company that made that manufactured equipment yeah. uh, to make clothes and so he was a great entrepreneur and I worked with him for a number of years just really kind of making money and he loved food too and I think it was around 1995, six, Henrietta Green wrote a book called The Food Lover's Guide to Britain. Yeah, yeah, and I was reading in there about all these kind of, you know, these great producers that were springing up around the UK. And I was like, I want to be one. And uh, and of course, the love of fish had never gone away. We were living in Bath. There was great cheese shop. There's great butchers, but there was yeah. no fishmongers. And, you know, if I reflected on what fishmongers looked like then, uh, there was a guy with white coats selling, you know, rubbish old fish, you know, white fish, never anything that exciting. And so I figured I wanted to do something like I'd seen abroad, you know, this wonderful fish shop with all a big array of seafood in. And I literally kind of gave up my job one day after driving down the motorway, listened to Paul Weller track and thought I'm not going back in. <laughs> and uh, and I, I sort of pushed this thing over the line and opened this fish shop without a care in the world, with very little knowledge. And uh, and after a couple of years of doing that, I was taking fish home with the cooking to Elizabeth David and Jane Griggs and very simple preparations. Yeah. And of course, in that in those days, you know, Fish was predominantly, you know, cooked in the French style. So a lot of cream sauces, all those things in restaurants. Yeah. And, uh, and I wasn't seeing this kind of all, all this fish being prepared in the ways that I was enjoying. And uh, so it was very natural. There was a premises upstairs or there was a, a room upstairs on two floors. 
And, uh, and so I scrapped, scraped the money together and opened a restaurant there. And that was called the Green Street Seafood Cafe. And that was where I sort of honed my love of love of seafood and, uh, and cooking. And uh, that became 13 restaurants. And uh, that was that was that was uh, grown up 10 of them in London, which was really great. Yeah. And I left in 2005 to come down here and start all this lot again. I came down for a quiet life, but of course, it didn't end up that way. <laughs> Well, tell us tell us a little bit about the business now then, um, Rockfish Restaurant Group. I mean, I'm lucky enough to live fairly close to you and uh, have quite an affinity with um, the different parts of your business. But please explain a little bit about the different parts of the group and how it's now made up. Sure. So the first restaurant we opened was called The Seahorse. And um, I opened it with uh, my pal Matt, who'd worked with me all the way through the, the journey to the restaurants. And we cooked together in the kitchen, which was really brilliant. And um, and now my son actually runs that restaurant. And, uh, you know, I'd always thought that seafood was one of, you know, if you think about seafood restaurants in the UK, they're, they're, they're fish and chip shops, or they're the Seahorse, Scott, Sheikis, they're always kind of high end, there was nothing in the middle. And you look at the States, and you know, people go out and eat seafood, like they eat pizza, you know, it's a real kind of choice over there. And I thought, right, I want to build a restaurant that kind of really takes seafood to the people that kind of does fried fish, grilled fish, and so forth. And so we opened the first rockfish restaurant next door to the seahorse. Yeah, and right. um, and that was that was like a journey in itself, going from, you know, I, people saying, how's your chippy? And I used to get really cross. It's not a chippy, which is a seafood restaurant, the fact that it sells <laughs> fish and chips. And, uh, and gradually over the years, uh, rockfish has grown into nine restaurants. And uh, we have another three that we're we're looking at opening over the next sort of uh, 24 months. And we, you know, I've always believed that, you know, a good fish restaurant um, is really all about the supply. I don't think it's good enough to be able to say, yeah, yeah. we buy our fish from here or buy it from there because so does everybody. Right. Yeah. And uh, and so we set about kind of buying our own, um, buying our suppliers out so that we could get closer to the uh, to the source yeah. and uh, indeed uh, get involved with a, with a fishing boat and setting up some direct relationships with lying fishermen that are lying catching for sea bass and potters yeah. and those kind of things. And uh, and that's been that's been fascinating. And, you know, during lockdown, uh, you know, that was an amazing thing for the restaurants. But then during lockdown, when we were sending out a few meal boxes. I had this real kind of like epiphany about uh, well, we, we actually landed the boat one morning. Uh, Nick, our skipper was out there and he was saying, Mitch, it's really difficult at the moment. You know, I'm going to land this fish on the market and, you know, it's going to fetch like 300 quid because prices were really depressed and everything else. And I yeah. said, Nick, why don't we why don't we just land it on the quayside? We'll send out an email to people. And see if people will buy it straight off the boat. We've got no scales. We're trying to bring can, uh, you know, containers down. And, you know, that's what we did. Well, I mean, I could not believe the amount of people that came down to buy fish. And we trebled the value of the catch. And it really kind of said to me that people, people want to buy fresh fish. And actually, when you think about the supply chain in Britain, it's usually through supermarkets, counters where fish is bought on spec, sat on a counter, waiting for somebody to buy it. And I just became increasingly passionate about improving that supply chain. Yeah, and yeah. why can't everybody in the country have that boat experience? Yeah. And uh, and so what we did was we started, send, we set up a business, said it's sending fish direct to people's homes. But in doing so, solved all the problems of helping them to cook it, taking the smell away, portioning, all of that stuff, butter, sauces going with it. And we've launched it a year ago today and we're, you know, we're, we're, we're doing good. And, uh, you know, the people that really get it are like, my God, this is, this is how I want to buy fish in the future, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think it's important. There are, as we know, people have associations. They see some barriers when it comes to, to fish and seafood. So if you can take all of those away, which you're clearly doing with mm. rockfish at home, it just makes it easy for people, doesn't it? Mm. It does. And I mean, that's, that's always been my passion, even from the day when I opened the fish market, first fish mongers, it was called the fish market was really to kind of help people look, here's all this amazing stuff. And people just didn't know what to do with it. And they would come in and I would learn recipes and I would sort of say, look, you know, put it in a bag, bit of wine, bit of thyme and some garlic. And they'd come back the following week and say, I did that. It was amazing. And uh, and that was how I really built the built the trade. And I think that, you know, to this day, nothing has changed in my in my mission and, uh, and in our mission as a business. And, and indeed, our internal mission statement is let's change the way people experience seafood because most people experience it in a way that is either fried fish very expensive or very expensive usually with bones usually not fresh yeah. um usually cooked in a way that you know i don't think is attractive and then you give people a piece of grilled gurnard and some sauce romesco and some olive oil and they go oh my god what is it about your fish and it's it's just fresh right i mean but they just haven't been used to it before and i think that's that's our mantra and and then we kind of work backwards from that how do we change that the gurnard with the uh, romesco sauce is a, a dish that my my daughter always cheeses when it's uh because that's on the menu at rockfish right yeah absolutely it's it's, it's a absolutely sort of... loves she absolutely loves that dish and goes for it every single time no it's great i mean rockfish is it's really interesting how rockfish has evolved i mean 
you know, the COVID years robbed us of a few years of progress where we had to kind of send the menus backwards. And yeah. you know, and now you're kind of eating mussels again and, you know, sea bream baked in Prosecco. And, yeah. you know, I've been up to Iceland sourcing haddock because, of course, fish prices have gone just crazy worldwide. And, um, you know, perhaps for a long time, they've actually been slightly depressed. You know, when you think about a kind of wild hunted, you know, product that's caught in a, in a sustainable way, nothing that's just been sort of, you know, hoovered up from the Barents Sea or wherever it was. And, uh, and up in Iceland, you know, I went up to see some fishermen there and just phenomenal seeing these guys catching these huge cod just off the coast yeah. and these huge haddock. And uh, and so we buy them by the haddock now in, in the spring season. And and we've just had the first, well, well, sorry, the autumn season. We've just had the the fish over here now. I mean, Charles, it is just utterly fantastic. And fried in batter, I'm like, my God, it's, you know, it's so good, but it's no longer your cheap dish, you know? No. I mean, I'm a massive fan of rockfish and regularly eat there with my family. But can you just describe what the essence of rockfish is all about? Are you Do you kind of connect people or hook people in, I guess, with the notion, you know, fish and chips? And that's the kind of anchor. But then you take them on a bit of a journey that explores other fish and seafood. What is what's the gap do you think you're trying to fill there with rockfish? Well, it's definitely, you know, I mean, I want people, you know, fish and chips is fantastic, right? Um, fish and chips is our national dish and done well i think you know i hate the word gourmet fish and chips fish and chips should just be be fish and chips yeah but i think the big gap was that we we love our white fish so much in this country uh cod and haddock being the main ones that we and that's all we really went for and what i wanted to do at rockfish was introduce people to the you know the other 40 species that we have around the, around the uk and the whole concept has been a kind of series of failures really because we started out with a menu of you know here's to here's lemon sold dover sold all this fish and then we realized that you can't catch those things every day, which of course we knew, but we thought we could somehow fill the supply chain. And then people would sit down and I'd say, uh, we've got no lemon sole, we've got no dover sole, we've got no squid today. And of course that's just the worst way to start off anyone's meal. Yeah. And uh, so that was a real, uh, real challenge. So what we did was to, uh, we evolved to putting the fish on the tablecloths. Yeah. So during whichever season we are, winter or summer, the species are written on the tablecloths and all the staff have a little booklet with all the information in, have to describe what a lemon sole or a piece of whiting is or a dab or, or something like that. And so we explain the fish and then we're able to write the prices of the fish that day because, of course, fish changes shape and size and price every single day. And some people find it really hard to sort of uh, get their heads around what 35 quid for a fish. I'm like, yes. And the reason being is because it's blowing a gale and next week it might be 29 quid because that's just the way of the fish markets. But that is the reality of eating fresh seafood. Yeah. And, and, and we've taken customers on, on that journey. And uh, and they really love the whole, oh, what have you got today? Come on, what's really, really good? And that's the excitement. So it's about introducing people to just the joy of seafood in, in, in a way that I think, I don't think has been done before in England. It's, a, there's, and I think what it means as well is that there's something for everyone as well, isn't there? You've got your core items, you've you've got your yeah. fish and chips, you've got, you know, you've got tacos and various other things that you know, they're, they're kind of, they're, they're reliable. And I, I know, you know, people that I eat there with, you know, there are certain favourites, but as you say, there's that real theatre as well, I think that comes with, and we've got this and they kind of circle it and write the price on it can be prepared this way or that way. So you can experiment a little bit more as well. So there's something, there's, it's something for everybody, isn't it? Yeah, it's really good. And, uh, you know, then we then we sort of, you know, we try and get people that we, we know that all our customers love to eat fish. And then we try and get them to buy their fish at home. Yeah. And, and that's that's our sort of, you know, next big kind of like goal is, you know, if you love to come here and eat it, let me help you cook it at home. And that's uh, that's that's really exciting. Can you tell me a little, tell us a little bit more about this, the seahorse? I know that, that was the first restaurant that you opened. You know, how did that come about? What is it that that is? Um, you know, what's its proposition, if you like, uh, the seahorse? Well, I think um, the Seahorse is a distillation of, of probably all my travels, all the great restaurants that I've been to in the world. And, you know, mainly in, in the Mediterranean, where I used to just sort of, you know, walk into restaurants and feel a presence in, and a feeling in restaurants that you just don't feel in the UK. And um, Matt and I were sat down one day in, in London, I think somewhere, and said, you know, when all this is over, opening restaurants in London, because we're both living in Bath, um, why don't we open a place together, you know, in um, down by the sea and just cook fish by the sea and have a simple life? <laughs> and uh, and that was really how, how the seahorse started. So it's really kind of um, it's an Italian restaurant. I mean, really, that's that's what it is. But we don't call it that because I think people in their own minds have this this check tablecloth and bolognese. Yeah, and uh, but the food is really inspired by the coast coast of Italy and uh, and southern Spain, really. And uh, so you, you, you'll you have calderetta stews, pastas, you know, they have some offal on there and. Uh, and sort of very regional um, Italian cuisine. 
And uh, Matt and I and, and a guy called Jake, um, we were the three of us cooked in that restaurant virtually every day for six, seven, eight years. Yeah. And uh, the restaurant is 15 years old next year. And we were always wondering, you know, how would our work continue? And, uh, and you know, Jake carried on being head chef and uh, he was he was like number one employee in all this. And now Jake runs sort of outside events and um, and, and really, you know, kind of right hand man there. And, uh, and my son and his partner, Bronte, took over the restaurant um, as a sort of, you know, him as head chef and her GM. And they're doing a great job. And, um, you know, it's taken some time for them to sort of really uh, find their feet and um, understand the customers and what the seahorse is all about. Because, as I said to Ben, it doesn't belong to us anymore. It belongs to the customers. And therefore, we have to um, we have to kind of respect and care for that. We can't just cook what we want to do. We have to cook what they want to eat. Yeah. And that's hard for a chef, to, especially a young chef. Uh, to get his head around when there's all this enthusiasm for things that you want to do and uh, but actually there's a lot you, you just can't do yeah I mean well as was one of my thoughts is how do you because it's an institution I, I think of it as an institution anyway so how do you evolve an institution <laughs> that's, that's yeah that's, that's keep it the same and I think that's the that's that that's the challenge yeah. And you have to kind of respect that we're getting a lot, lot more, a lot of new people coming into the seahorse now because Ben and Bronte are attracting a little younger crowd. Yeah. But I think the challenge for the seahorse is that, you know, we we take a piece of fish and do very little to it. I mean, Ben has got cooking a turbot over an open fire, <laughs> it, it could, done to a way that I don't know anyone else that can do it in the way that the way that he does it. But to eat a turbot over an open fire is, you know, could be anything from seventy to a hundred quid. Yeah depending on the cost of the fish on the day and the size of the fish. So we're really dealing in a luxury product that is just handled so well. And I think sometimes people come in and say, is that it? It's like, that's it. That's yeah. what we do. We just, we just get great fish and we do very little to it and stuff. And so it's, there's still some education to there as well. You know, I have to ask you, how easy is it for you, for you being hands off? <laughs> uh, actually, difficult i have to say i mean for the first couple of years i found it really hard although i'm doing a shift a double shift on saturday with ben which i'm really looking forward to oh fantastic and um and uh and that's good but i i'm also fully aware that my own capabilities at my age of being in a kitchen working four shifts in the way they do is is is, is over and um and you, and you just gotta let it go really yeah you're obviously you're running a seafood restaurant group can I, I want to ask you a bit about sustainability and what sustainability means for you when you're i guess you know you you're going through you'll be going through a, a significant quantity of fish and seafood on a weekly basis how do you align that with sustainability and what does all that mean for you it's a really interesting question charles i mean we're first of all we're based right on the quayside so we work um solely with uh, our local fleet so we understand um quotas what's going on here and, and and really brixham is only only has about 10 or 12 day boats left now and 17 beam trawlers it's a tiny fishing fleet in comparison to the huge fleets that you might see around holland uh in europe and certainly uh fishing out of asia mm -hmm. and uh and up in the barents sea where the boats are really big extracting even up in scotland extracting tons of mackerel in in, in very short periods of time it's a small fleet we also work with msc product so we won't have any if, if we won't have anything on the menu that's not msc or local we I, I need to understand what's really behind it where it's where it's coming from but i think the real challenge for for it is that 20 years ago the sustainability debate was really all about how much fish is left in the sea and how do we control it yeah. now of course we've got carbon uh we've got community um we've got comparisons of this fishery against other fisheries around the world we've got fisheries becoming a huge global issue and my fear is that the kind of big headline challenges that we face around the world somehow just brush paint the same picture for the very small scale fishermen that we work with. And even if, you know, looking at a beam trawler, which is, you know, a, a third, probably a 20 meter boat, 25 meter boat, maybe, um, you know, they're pretty big. Um, they drag heavy gear and there's huge debates, you know, going on around whether that gear is sustainable or not and the damage it does. And, you know, I've listened to a lot of it and it's something that hasn't been resolved yet. So therefore the debate is much more complicated, but I think what we do is we, we stay right in the, right in the debate and, uh, and, and learn and help and influence. And, uh, and that's, that, that's, 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 that we take it very seriously, I guess, is, is what we're saying. It's a big part of it. We have somebody dedicated in the company who really just looks after MSC and sustainability. And was that one of the reasons that you, got into um you know getting a boat and that kind of thing does that help you to be completely in control of that supply chain as well yeah it does i think it's you know our boat is only a little boat so she won't catch everything we need but i think what it gave 
what certainly what it gave me was a real direct understanding of the um, challenges that fishermen face and the economics of uh, of indeed of indeed how hard fishing is to make money. And when you look around the fishing port here, there are not young men queuing up with a million quid to go and buy a fishing license and quota to go to sea. So one of the biggest threats, I think, to uh, to fishing in the future is actually having people to catch it. Yeah, yeah. I noticed um, when I was in uh, Rockfish um, earlier in the year that you'd actually taken cod off the menu. Um, yeah. What was the, what was the what was the reason for for doing that? Well, you took it off uh, and left it on. <laughs> Well, we, we we took it off and then and then and put hake on. So what, yeah. what actually happened was we sat down one day and we were looking at the cost of cod. And I also didn't realize that um, Russia caught so much of the world's cod up in the Barents Sea. And we used to buy off some Norwegian boats, two Norwegian boats. And we would buy 32 ounce plus cod fillets and we would portion them. So you got really lovely big flakes of uh, flakes of fish. And we used to buy that cod at about 160 a box. And the last lock in was 280 a box. And really, it just became, you know, this cod and chips needs to be probably 22, 23 quid yeah. for us to be able to sustain any kind of margin that pays the rent, pays the staff and keeps yeah, it going. I think the world is ready for it. And, and and the reason the cost price went up was, of course, the, the Russian boats were heavily um, um, tariffed oh. and I didn't want to buy off Russian boats. So I said, look, why do we have to have cod on the menu yeah. when we've got beautiful hake here that we work hard to try and sell alongside cod? If we take the cod out then we take people on a journey of, of what we've always wanted to do and, and in a way we were sort of forced into it and so we, we we did it and i think people in the restaurant um have been understanding yeah. i think people in the takeaways less understanding because i think people come into a takeaway and say but i just want cod and chips i don't mm. want to have it they don't want anything else so there were plenty of places for them to go and we've recently been tasting you know smaller fish from different boats and i can't get my head around the, the quality versus the price the yeah. cod eating experience is about a lovely big chunky fillet and actually this haddock we're getting in is a, is a better eating experience and yeah. so that's that's really what drives us you know yeah i think um the hay can also i mean you're doing um a, a relative of mine when we were there a couple of weeks ago had um battered was, uh, would it have been battered whiting yeah fantastic yeah. i tasted some uh, large white amazing. Yes, amazing. i really enjoyed that it's fantastic yeah. yeah it's a delicious fish we were doing some tastings yesterday morning we just introduced whiting to the menu because yeah you know, we still want people to come and eat for 15 quid and have unlimited chips, which is what you want, as well as your 30 quid fish. And it's been very hard to spread that gap. But we're, we're there now, I think. Yeah. Well, I love the fact that you'd that you'd actually you'd left it on the menu, but they provided an explanation as to, you know, as yes. to why, you know, that why it's not available and that, it you know, will be back at a point in time and that kind of thing. But in the meantime, we've got these other options. And I, yeah, I thought that was. I, was I think when you're, I think if you're if you're trying to do something in a category, you've got to take a leadership position, right? Yeah. And sometimes they're they're difficult, and sometimes they're challenging, and sometimes they could be really damaging. But when we sat there as a team, I said, you know, listening to all of this and going through it all, it's the right thing for our business, it's the right thing for cod, and it's the right thing to encourage people to eat more local species, and and we're just going to have to do it. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, we're, we're pleased with that yeah. decision. Well, whilst you a lovely segue actually, you talk about uh, local species. I'd really like to talk about um, your canned um, or tin seafood range. Um, we caught up recently at a pop up. We um, had six or seven superb um, local, um, uh, sorry, tinned uh, tin seafood dishes. How did this whole uh, and you were demonstrating the versatility of them, and they were incredible and in serving them in context that perhaps I wouldn't have even considered. But how did this whole tin seafood um, project come about? It was actually before lockdown, so, so 2019. I was thinking I, I would just love to have a rockfish can, a rockfish tin sardines, mm. be a wonderful currency to have to give people, and um, and so I found somebody in Spain who would um, pack them for us with the, with the recipes that we we wanted to. There were, there were really no canners that we could work with in the UK. There were only two big canneries that were on a big industrial scale. And uh, so I went over to Spain to see the guys and we we, we produced these um, these sardines. Quite small quantity, but they were, the quality was just utterly fantastic. And um, so it kind of set me thinking during lockdown, I'd really love to can every species of British seafood. Mm -hmm. And again, we did a search around the country. Where could we do it here? Could we set up a cannery here? And the answer was just, you know, cost prohibitive, but yeah. mostly... The skill levels of fish preparation 
just really hard to exist in this country. I mean, you go to Spain and see these canneries where on the front line, the people doing it are generally women and the way they handle fish is just so skillful and so incredible. So um, we started to send things like cuttlefish, live mussels, sardines, mackerel all over to Spain to be um, uh, to be tinned. And uh, I bought some Spanish tuna, actually, while I was in from from north of Spain, uh, fresh tuna. I wanted to know what fresh packed tuna was like in a tin. And I think we created this really luxurious um, range of tin seafood. And, um, you know, we hope that in the future we'll be able to can it in the UK. And I, I don't have a problem with canning in the UK, but it's really interesting how because it's British seafood, people want it canned in the UK. Yeah. And I, I'm like, well, we ex we import oranges every day and wine. We export seafood every day uh, yeah. to Spain. And we're just on the conveyor belt and we're kind of supporting small communities in, in northern Spain. But I, th I still think people can't quite get their heads around British seafood being canned in Spain. And uh, so we'll solve that one here and eventually be able to do it. But I think um, I think for now, I mean, the quality that we've learned is just unbelievable. It's yeah. great. What are, the, what are some of the different um, uh, the different products that are in the rain? <clears throat> well, cuttlefish cooked in ink sauce. So we send over cuttlefish here and uh, we freeze it on the on the quayside and uh, it gets cooked in steamed in its skin with all its ink and then stripped everything stripped away and uh, and then uh, and then cut into pieces and then, you know, we make a sauce with the with the ink and that goes into the tin with it. So you get this really wonderful tender cuttlefish uh, sardines we send over and they're grilled whole. They literally go through a, through a, through a grill. And, and then the heads get taken off so that you don't get any dryness to the to the meat of the sardines. Yeah, okay. yeah. And and the mackerel are uh, steamed whole. So these are really lovely, juicy torbay mackerel. We buy a couple of ton. Again, we freeze them immediately, leave the guts in. Uh, that's how they, they are canned. And then they're steamed. And the head and the guts and the skin is all peeled off by hand and then taken off the bone and then snipped with um, uh, scissors into a, into a tin and uh, an oil over the top. And then mussels, we take live lime bay mussels and we, we they go over in the shell. They get um, steamed, taken out the shell by hand, then deep fried, and then laid in the tin by hand and uh, with a marinade over the top. And it's been really interesting getting to learn some of the flavorings, but we've, we're doing sardines inside of vinegar. We're doing, um, we're hoping to do a lovely little freedom air with cockles and stuff like this. But oh, of course, wow. yeah. the, the, the other, the other, Real challenge is obviously is the uh, since Brexit, it's just so difficult to be able to export fish because we have to consolidate it on a lorry with somebody else. And if our paperwork isn't quite right, they condemn the whole lorry. And there's very few people that will let your stuff go on the same lorry. Yes. And uh, this makes it more and more difficult because we only want to can small amounts. But we, we've got a plan. We've got a plan. But one of the things that really struck me about the canned seafood range is the flavour. I think the, the, the flavour of the, the fish itself and what you were just describing there. Um, those surely are the elements that that drive into that. You know, if you're steaming and cooking fish whole, leaving the heads on and the gut, the, the guts in and then you know, preparing them and placing them in the tins by hand or well, that the way that you're cooking uh, that, that kind of considered I guess probably a craft way of, of, of cooking it is um is you know will drive into the flavor a lot yeah completely I mean when you when you realize I mean craft is the right word we call it craft canning and and it's uh you know it really is amazing to see it by hand but we we kind of got this term that we use internally that we're probably going to use externally as well we call it sea cootery yeah. And uh, so this is this is taking, you know, um, as you say, just amazing products and trying to preserve it. But the other thing about it all, it it, it drove our sustainability debate because, yeah. as a company, we're we're just approaching um, becoming a B Corp, and we've been working towards that for yeah. about a year now. Yeah. And a lot of that thinking has changed. Um, so a lot of the things we do, and so this whole sustainability thing wasn't good enough for us just to have a tick. It was how can we do something that supports gluts of seafood? Yeah. So, you know, we're very open about what we, what we send fresh, what we send frozen and canning was just another, another way of supporting, um, you know, that whole uh, sustainability um, issue when yeah. there's plenty of sardines, you can them. Yeah. In the UK, I mean, we've got a great history of preserving, but I think when it comes to tin seafood, it's either, you know, tuna mixed with some mayo or some sardines mm. smushed onto a piece of toast we we don't seem to value it perhaps in the same way that the spanish or portuguese do i mean do you agree and, and do you think that is changing in any way i definitely agree charles i mean i think that you know sardines and mackerel are the biggest you know in yeah. glenrick in tomato sauce you know that's that's how fish was canned and that's that's what i used to eat as a, as a kid as well you know tin fish and ship them sardine or crab pate yeah and uh, and that, that's how it was done but of course in spain um 
and, and Italy, it's a real craft. And uh, they really understand how that preservation can preserve, you know, small catches of things. So I was recently in, in uh, um, southern Spain and I bought, a t I bought a whole load of stuff in a store, but I bought one tin of clams that was uh, 54 euros. And each of the each of those clams cost four pounds each. Uh, and they were they were harvested from a particular rear in uh, in Galicia. But the taste of these clams was just utterly, utterly delicious. And, you know, with some butter, some onions and uh, and, and these clams on, on a piece of soft bread, it was just truly and utterly magical. And, you know, tin fish isn't meant to be like the fresh version. No. Something amazing happens in the tin. But I love the idea that I'm eating uh, this particular seafood that was caught at this particular time. And um, and, th and there it was preserved. But I think we're getting it. There are restaurants that are opening now serving tin seafood. I mean, we sell quite a lot of tin seafood in Rockfish yeah. and uh, we sit on a board and people sit there and eat it. And, and gradually as they're getting, oh, I, well, this is good. This is filling. Yeah. This is not, not not kind of poor food anymore. They really love it. And it's, it's so incredibly versatile as well. I mean, um, in the, the pop up that that um, that you ran at Pulo a few months ago. Um, I mean, I'm I'm very open minded, clearly, when it comes to food. But some of the thing, you know, the, the presentations and the and and the way that you were, the, the context within which you were presenting those dishes. Um, you know, with the was it um, was it a tom yum uh, salad with a papaya? Yeah. Was that was that one of them? Yeah. So we did. I mean, the whole menu consists of you know taking sardines and making yeah. um a sardine patty blitz them up with um uh, cream cheese calabrian chili and some fennel so you get this lovely patty that's spread on toast and uh, i do that with butter at home as well just you know whiz up some butter and sardines yeah. in, a, in a blender and let it set and they've got sardine butter that's going on hot toast you know a bit of cucumber on the top black pepper delicious yeah. um then we made a um uh, a sri lankan curry so you make a lovely sri lankan sauce yeah. and then you put half of the oil and the, and the mackerel in it just to warm through and you get this wonderful kind of fish curry um the sontan thai which is a yeah, traditional sontan, salad awesome. you know with a lots of chili lots of coriander thai basil garlic and lime juice sugar fish sauce and so you toss all that together and then we deep fry the tin sardines until they're really crispy crumble them over the top so you just like the kind of fried little fish that you'd have in thailand and then i think one of my favorites actually tuna and russian salad which is so good it's just one of those like you know it's tuna mayonnaise supercharged and then uh, I really do enjoy um, the cuttlefish. So the cuttlefish, we just literally warm it up straight out of the tin. Um, creamy mashed potato or polenta. And pour the cuttlefish over the top, Venetian style, and some orange gremolata, orange zest, chopped garlic, chopped parsley, strewn over the top, bit of thyme, and, you know, you're away. And that's what you can do with tin seafood. You know, it's just so versatile. Yeah, and all yeah, all of those are in contrast, complete contrast to what we would perhaps think of of tin yeah. seafood. So yeah, I mean, long may more and more people get uh, on on board with that and see the possibilities with uh, with tinned. Um, they're not only delicious, but they also come in the most beautiful boxes. What's with the what's with the artwork, if I can ask? Well, uh, the artwork was, I mean, I, I quite, Tin Fish has this thing, that I think it just sort of encourages colour and art. Yes. And uh, my wife, Penn, is a great painter. And I just said, Penn, we, we just knock something up. And so she sat up over a few nights and just did them. And uh, and that's how they ended up on the packs. And, uh, you know, so we, we, we're going to keep that bold, colourful theme going all oh, the way through. Really cool. Great. Yeah, it's yeah, really good. Truly, tr 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 truly beautiful they look as good in the in the boxes as they do on the plate that's for sure right. just to bring us back a little bit to the here and now um, i mean um it's absolutely no secret we've talked about costs and so on already at the moment we're clearly heading into a recession how are you thinking about the future future proofing your business how hard do you think hospitality is going to be here i think hospitality is in for a really really rough time and i think it's um you know as, as many sectors are um this is worse than COVID. Um, it's uh, it's ever changing landscape that just moves week to week, month to month, um, both for our consumers and our businesses. And my my focus really on the moment at the moment is really to just keep being a great restaurant, yeah. uh, accepting that we are going to have a really really difficult three or four months, and possibly longer. And really just trying to work out how do we how do we keep jobs, how do we keep up standards how do we get through this hiatus of a period and keep our focus on the longer term yeah. and not be detracted into the shorter term? Because it, if you start to make short-term knee-jerk reactions, I think it can be dangerous to your future. But if you don't make the right choices now, then then you may not have a future. So I think at the moment, it's um, it's a delicate balance that's just unfolding. And I think you just have to kind of almost see what cards you're dealt with week by week. Yeah. Yeah. And as you say, it is, it's, it's changing 
it's changing rapidly, isn't it? It's a very dynamic situation. And I think yeah, it is hugely. I mean, I feel for, I feel for everyone in, in in business now, and you know, in hospitality too, because you know, usually if there's something wrong in your business, you can you have the ability to fix it. Mm -hmm. At the moment, I feel like we're just we're just we're just it's arrows. You know, energy yeah. prices, input prices, customers haven't got any money. Staff need to more money to be to, so they can meet the challenges of uh, of living today. Interest rates are going up. C bills loans need repaying, um, and you're just sort of oh my word! I mean, there there is no uh, uh, sort of like good bit of it really. Yeah, just uh, a couple of other questions. What um, what's so special for you about the southwest? I know Brixton and Dartmouth in particular very close to your heart. What what what's the what's the pull? I mean, you know, every time I go away from the Southwest, I realize just how beautiful it is. And when I think about the walks in the morning, jumping in the sea, the color of the sea, the sunshine, it's very easy to get complacent, isn't it, with a, with a place. And then you you travel somewhere else. You say, oh, this is really, really gorgeous. And you come back to it. And I think I, I probably decided 15 years ago that this was my place. Yeah. And once you decide that a place is your place. And somehow it starts to take on a lot more importance to you. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'm definitely guilty of not getting much further than I, I rarely get to the South Hams. And yet the South Hams is beautiful, <laughs> but there's just not enough time. Right. I mean, you, there's so much to do around the place we are. Yeah, definitely. It's a beautiful, beautiful part of the world. And uh, yeah, it gets you, gets you here in the heart, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah massively. What's um, yeah, um, f favorite fish dish? <clears throat> Favorite fish dish, really interesting. I mean, I, I, I mean, red mullet is my favorite fish to eat. I think that there's nothing better than a grilled red mullet. Just truly, truly wonderful. But I really do love fish soups. You know, a rich, lovely Mediterranean flavor, or or a fresh crab with mayonnaise, just brilliant. Yeah, fresh crab. Uh, um, awesome. Most underrated fish. Most underrated fish, probably whiting. I'd say those large whiting when you get those really big, big mm. flakes. They're uh, they're truly fabulous. Mm. And what? Um... Not that I'm sure you get a huge amount of time, but what do you what do you do to relax? <clears throat> I'm a sailor in my spare time, so I've uh, I like to jump on my sailing boat with three mates, and uh, we we like to just head off for a few days or across the channel, and uh, and when we're not sailing, just messing around on the boat really, and uh, or cooking for my kids. I think I think one of the things I've realised I just love being close to my kids, and I'm blessed that they are we're working together and that they live around the area, so um, we we often eat together and do stuff together, so it's lovely. Yeah, there is no greater joy actually than cooking for for family and those most important to you, sharing the love. It's uh, that's absolutely a really yeah. special special feeling. Um, my last um, question: um, When you think about the future, and I, you know, when I introduced you, I you know talked about some many of the things that you've done. What would you like uh, or envisage your legacy being in food and drink? I would hope that you know, in in time, that there are. 20 rockfish restaurants, all in really great places, providing wonderful jobs, um, having an economic and environmental impact in the towns that they're in, yeah. uh, all being supported by a cooperative of small scale fishermen landing their fish that was being sorted and sent to the restaurants. And I think that if people can carry on coming to the seaside in Devon and Dorset and eat and enjoy um, seafood for the next two, three, four, five generations, uh i think i think that would have been a, a good job done yeah absolutely well mitch thank you so much for joining this episode of the food people in conversation with on behalf of us all at the food people and this the in conversation with audience thanks so much for joining me for today for telling your story for talking about sustainability why you do what you do how it all started uh and of course uh tinned seafood it's been a real eye-opener and of course a real pleasure so thank you so much for joining us today it's a pleasure Charles. very nice chatting to you thank you so do join our tfp community for the details of our latest in conversation with episodes as well as the latest free to access food and drink trends for site visit the foodpeople.co.uk and complete your details at the footer of the page on behalf of mitch and myself thanks for joining the food people in conversation with do join with us in the trends of today and the foresight of tomorrow to shift the future of food and drink by harnessing the power of trends and i'll just leave you with one question as always and that is how are you a champion of change and how are you shifting the future of food and drink thanks for listening <laughs>